All right, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Pneumatic or Electric, How to Decide Which Actuator Use, brought to you by Design World. We would like to thank our sponsor today, BIMBA. I'm Paul Heaney, Editorial Director for Design World, and I will be moderating this webinar today. Just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. Not everyone who wanted to attend today's webinar was able to do so, so if you could help out by tweeting key points and takeaways, we would all greatly appreciate that. Be sure to always include the hashtag that is specific to this webinar, pound sign P versus E, in your tweets. We will have a Q&A session after the presentation. Go ahead and submit your questions in the questions box that is in the GoToWebinar panel that should be on the right side of your screen, and we will ask as many of them as we can after the presenter is finished. Today's presenter is Bob Crawl. Bob is a fluid power specialist with Bimba Manufacturing Company. He has a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, an MBA, and is a Certified Fluid Power Specialist. Bob will be discussing the differences between pneumatic and electric actuators and will outline the decision process for successful, efficient, and cost-effective deployment. Bob is going to compare pneumatics performance characteristics, costs, and best-case application scenarios to those of electrics. And make sure you stick around at the end because Bob will be showing us a very cool and free pneumatic electric cost comparison software tool that will also be made available to all attendees. So without further ado, I will hand the mic over to Bob. Thank you, Paul. So we're going to be talking about uh, the pneumatic versus electric decision. And uh, I don't know how many of you have read articles uh, and white papers from various companies, but uh, generally, uh, if you're an electric actuator company, you focus on the cost of the compressor. And you say, you know, you, you want to use that many pneumatic actuators, well, compressor costs are killing you. And on the other side, of course, the uh, pneumatic houses will, will focus on uh, the, the apparent uh, foolishness of replacing a $20 pneumatic actuator with a $2,000 electric. And uh, a balanced point of view where you look at all of the details surrounding the decision uh, isn't usually uh, available, at least I haven't found it. So that's what this is all about. So this is this is the structure. First of all, what, what are our criteria that we use to, to evaluate pneumatic versus electric? Then we'll go into pneumatic and, and uh, talk about the performance advantages and disadvantages, uh, the cost characteristics, and then characterize a scenario that would be best for pneumatics to be used in. And similarly with electric, we'll talk about uh, performance characteristics, <coughs> costs associated with electric actuators, and then what are the uh, what are the conditions under which electric would be the best choice. Then we'll go into a case study where pneumatic wins out over electric, another case study where electric wins out over pneumatic. And then we come to our freebie. I was hoping to be able to offer everybody a Caribbean cruise, but we'll have to settle for the pneumatic versus electric cost calculator. And then, of course, as, as was said, uh, questions and answers afterwards. If you look at the lower right corner of this page, you'll see an electric actuator and a pneumatic actuator. And, and to your eyes, you're saying, well, it looks like the rod and rod threads are about the same. It looks like the stroke length is fairly equal. Uh, they're even about the same diameter. You know, I bet one is the same as the other. And, and the fact of the matter is, regardless of, of what people tell you, the technologies are so incredibly different that uh, that one can't be an, an exact replacement for the other. It just isn't uh, available today. Each has its unique set of performance advantages and disadvantages. Each has its own characteristic installation and maintenance costs. Each has its own operating costs, which in this case are mainly what we're mainly concerned with is electric power consumption. And then there's the separate issue that needs to be considered, which is if you deploy a technology, 
Is it going to give you some sort of productivity gain? Is it going to reduce downtime, increase capacity, or save labor costs? Uh, all of these things need to be considered, and all of these will be factored in. Next. Let's look at the electric um, There we go. OK. Uh, let's look at the uh, pneumatic actuator performance characteristics. Uh, first of all, one of the, one of the salient characteristics of pneumatic actuators is force and speed are independent. You control speed via flow controls. You control force via air pressure. And our uh, original line cylinders can operate up to 250 PSI. So there's a tremendous force range uh, that can be accomplished with these, uh, with these uh, cylinders. And for the size and for the price, uh, you really can't beat the bang for the buck. There's a disadvantage to that in that I think you'll find that most often pneumatic cylinders are oversized simply because it's easy to do so. Uh, there isn't much of a cost associated with going from a, uh, let's say, an inch and a sixteenth to an inch and a half diameter cylinder. Uh, so a lot of times people will go that extra route that then say, well, let's just reduce the air pressure to get to the, uh, to the force that we need. Very small footprint. It's relatively easy to implement. Uh, disadvantage performance characteristic is it's usually extend and retract only, and people who are familiar with pneumatics will tell you that uh, there, are, there are closed loop pneumatic cylinders. There are controllers for them. Uh, there are is position feedback, but in general, pneumatic cylinders are extend and retract only. And uh, there are there there is a, a rather involved pneumatic system around uh, uh, the pneumatic uh, actuators. You require, of course, a compressor, air lights, fittings, filters, regulators, lubricators. And all of these things have to be in the vicinity of your installation of pneumatic cylinders. So it limits, to a certain extent, where your pneumatic actuators can be deployed. When you look at pneumatic actuator costs, we all know that component costs are low. Uh, however, there is the issue of the compressor. And uh, according to the Department of Energy, they say about 76% uh, of the operating costs are due to the compressor power consumption. By that, I mean electrical power consumption. There's a number of things that affect this. The size of the compressor. Uh, it's the time that it's on, the time that it's off. Uh, very often, people will allow a compressor to idle rather than turning it off. If it is not turned off and you have a large compressor, it can consume an awful lot of electricity. And uh, the bottom line here is that if you've oversized your cylinders, and if you've oversized your compressor, there's the potential to waste a lot of money. So efficiency there can, can really mean a lot. Uh, there are other operating and maintenance costs that we say occupy about 24% uh, of the uh, operating costs. And for pneumatics, the best scenario for deployment is generally a large-scale deployment, a compressor that's efficiently sized versus the number of actuators, the number of pneumatic devices being used. And that kind of tells you if, if, if your facility is a large facility and you've downsized, downsizing the compressor may actually pay for itself in a very short period of time. And the best scenario also involves a condition for pneumatics where there's minimal labor savings of production downtime savings that are achievable through automation. 
So by this I mean having a flexible process uh, through some form of position feedback uh, is would not yield a significant significant gain. Now let's look at uh, electrical electric actuated performance characteristics. Unlike pneumatics, electric actuators trade speed for thrust and thrust for speed. What's this due to? Well, it's due to motor characteristics. Generally, motor torque drops off with speed. Uh, generally, if you want to increase thrust in an electric actuator, the screw has a shorter lead, uh, meaning inches per turn of the screw. So the shorter lead translates to more thrust, less speed. So this is a this is a compromise that we have to be aware of. And that is the reason that sizing is critical. If you look at a pneumatic actuator and say, well, uh, it produces 100 pounds of thrust, therefore I need an electric that puts uh, puts out 100 pounds of thrust. What you may be doing inadvertently is providing bad design information. If you have a pneumatic application, I think the best thing to do is to get is to actually measure the loads in the system when you're applying electric so you do not oversize. Obviously, if you're undersized with a pneumatic actuator, you can increase the pressure. With an electric actuator, you're stuck with it. So undersized act uh, actuators will simply not perform. And these force and speed limits are kind of locked in by design, and there's a minimum of variability associated with it. Of course, electric actuators provide precise control of positioning, and they can adapt the sheets to flexible processes. And usually in a plant, there's an electric outlet anywhere, so if you need to add some sort of facility to a machine, it's relatively easy to do. You just plug in the electric actuator, install it, and it's ready to go. So to that extent, it's portable. Of course, it's a little bit more complex to implement than pneumatic because of the control side of the, of the uh, actuator. Let's look, oops. Let's look at electric actuator costs. Yes, compared to pneumatics, it has a high unit cost. Yes, it also that would also mean it has a high replacement cost. Uh, what I found is that if you buy an all-in-one unit, the all-in-one units, meaning controller built in, motor built in to the actuator, a unitary type construction, when it comes time to replace it, you have to replace the whole device. Actually, when you look at an electric actuator, the wear components are the mechanical components predominantly. You'll find that the they'll have the shortest life of the application, but the motors and the electrical components have a longer life. If you only need to replace the mechanical wear components, it actually is a little bit more economical over the long run, and sometimes it can be fairly significant. Low power consumption, uh, a characteristic of electric, eliminating a compressor. Uh, and there's flexibility that can yield savings. So through programmability, through that flexibility, you have for example, an opportunity to, let's say, change a conveyor rail, uh, have that done, eliminate the production downtime associated with that, and eliminate the changeovers, and eliminate labor associated with making the change. It stands to reason that this is not something that just happens automatically. This is something that has to be carefully planned. If, if, if it's a pill conveyor that's about 30 feet long, the time associated with changing a rail may be 30 seconds. If it's hundreds of feet of rail in a large bottling facility, let's say, that might be a different story. 
there might be a lot more losses in terms of downtime, a lot more costs in terms of people. So a lot of it depends on exactly how it's being used. And the best scenario for electrics is smaller scale deployments, which obviously minimizes component individual component costs, and, and, and de deployments where process improvements are affected by the choice of electric. This next slide I felt compelled uh, to put in there because very often when you're, when you're dealing with the cost of electricity, it depends where you're at. Uh, if you're in Connecticut or New York, for example, uh, that's about 17 cents per kilowatt hour. If you're in Idaho, it's 5.7 cents per kilowatt hour. So in my calcul calculations, I use 10 cents, which is about, according to this slide, the average retail price of electricity. Uh, but it can vary widely, and results can can be affected by that. Uh, I would just suggest that you look at your own electric bill and, and see what that amount is. One of the things that I did not include in this presentation is some compressor sizing information. So I intentionally left that out, say that that's beyond the scope of what we're doing here. The inputs would be the average bore size of all the sil pneumatic cylinders you're using, the average stroke length, the average time for the stroke, the number of cylinders, and the percent of cylinders that actuate simultaneously. This has to be kind of an estimate. And the closer you get to nailing all of the characteristics of the, of the uh, pneumatic cylinders that are being deployed, the better your numbers will be. But in general, this would be a guideline. The output would be the CFM required for the compressor. And then what you would do, the final step, is to find uh, a, com a compressor with, uh, with a horsepower rating that can produce the CFM number. And the only way you'd get that is from manufacturer specifications. I suppose the other thing that I didn't include here are the effects of leaks in the system. The effects of leaks, uh, any compressed air system leaks. Uh, maybe a well-maintained system could lose 10% of the capacity of the compressor through leaks. Maybe a poorly maintained system could could lose 30 percent. So I didn't bother to consider maintenance issues uh, of the of the uh, pneumatic system losses due to leaks or losses due to uh, shall we say frivolous use of the compressor. Uh, but that does factor in at some point. So let's look at a, at a case where pneumatics went out over electrics. Here's the pneumatic solution. It uses a big 200 horsepower compressor. It's running 2,000 hours per year at full load, 93% efficiency. And importantly here, uh, I've got it in red. It says when not in use, it is off. Uh, the, the, the thing here is you might be led to think that because it's a huge 200 horsepower compressor, it's gobbling a lot of electricity. But the fact is, it's being used in an efficient way. The other, the other thing that's in red is 150 pneumatic actuators are deployed. So although we have a huge compressor, we are utilizing it close to its capacity. We have a lot of pneumatic cylinders involved. The average unit cost is $50. Average life expectancy for the pneumatic actuators is three years. We have an equivalent electric solution. 150 electric actuators are deployed. These are all-in-one designs. Uh, everything's in it except the DC power supply. The average unit cost is $1,200. Average life expectancy is three years. And the reason I got the all-in-one design in red is because the implication is at the end of three years, you need to replace it. There are 
details below. Actuator draws fully loaded at 48 volts, uh, draw six amps fully loaded at 48 volts DC, and it's fully loaded 30% of the time. And it draws three amps at 48 volts DC 70% of the time. And then I have a current draw of the power supplies and then their current and output voltage. These are things that you would have to get from the specifications of the manufacturer and uh, would have to plug it into our, our spreadsheet. So looking at the pneumatic solution as I defined it, the annual cost of compressed air is a whopping $42,237. The replacement costs for the actuators is $2,500 per year. So the total annual cost is $44,737. And I just divided by the number of actuators to come up with a figure that says $298. So although the original price was 50 bucks, if you factor in operating costs, cost of operating the press, compressor, etc., it comes out to about $298 per actuator. Now let's look at the electrical solution. The annual cost at full load is $4,320. Annual cost at idle, this is for electric power consumption, is $5,000. So that the annual operating cost is $9,360. Compare that to the operating cost of pneumatics, which was $44,737. However, the replacement cost of the actuators is $60,000 per year. So the total annual cost is $69,360. Uh, the concept here is that the replacement cost of the actuators and the scale of deployment uh, makes them very expensive. Here's a couple of bar graphs where we're comparing pneumatic costs to electric costs. And what I need to call your attention to are the scales. Uh, you notice on the left bar chart, it says total cost per year in thousands of dollars. And it goes from 0 to 45. In the right bar chart, it's also the left scale is also total cost per year in thousands. But it goes from 0 to 70. So although these two graphs are the same size, uh, inch-wise, the scales are a little bit different. So I want to call your attention to that. For pneumatic costs, what I wanted to show here is the cost, the original cost with the 200 horsepower compressor, and the cost if a 100 horsepower compressor could be used instead. And you'll notice that the total operating cost per year drops from $45,000 to $25,000. So efficiently sizing a compressor can mean quite a bit of savings every year. On the electrical side, you'll notice that the all-in-one has a total operating cost per year of about $70,000. That can be reduced to about $45,000 if you go to a modular design. So where we said that the, that the electric solution was rather expensive, it can be moderated by moderating the replacement costs of the equipment that has to be, that, that is designated as the wear items. So now let's look at a scenario where electrics went out over pneumatics. The pneumatic solution uses a 100 horsepower compressor. It's run 2,000 hours per year at full load at 90% efficiency. And that information is taken off the nameplate of the compressor. And the cost for electricity is a dime per kilowatt hour. That's what I used. When not in use, it is idling at 25% power at 85% efficiency. This is something that you would have to estimate yourselves 
for your individual applications. Only 20 pneumatic actuators are deployed. The average user's cost is 50 bucks, like in the previous example. Life expectancy is three years, also similar. Now let's look at the electric solution. 20 electric actuators are deployed. It's a modular design. The motor and actuator are together and the controllers are separate. Average unit cost is $900 for the actuator, $1,200 for electronics. Life expectancy is three years for the actuators, 10 years for the electronics. Then I have actuator draw at full load, actuator current draw and voltage uh, at idle, uh, power supply, power draw and output. And all of that, again, would come from specification sheets for those electric components. Also, we have a situation where the electric actuator allows for a process in, in, uh, improvement. It automates a line change. So it saves two hours every week for two employees at $30 per hour each. And it saves two hours of lost production where, where 100 products could have been produced at a, at a dollar per product. So when, let's look at the top half of this first. The annual cost of compressed air is about 22000 The annual cost of compressed air at idle is $19,000. And the replacement cost of the actuator is actually very low. It's $333. But because that compressor is running all the time, it's a $41,000 per year annual cost. And the total cost for, act for the actuators because of the small scale of deployment is actually quite expensive. When we look at the electric solution, on the other hand, we notice that the annual cost at full load is, is about 600 about the same amount at idle. So the cost of electricity is only $1,200, which is just a fraction of that large compressor. The replacement cost of the actuators is $2,400 per year, or of the electronics is $2,400 per year. Replacement cost of the actuators is $6,000 per year. So the total annual cost of this deployment, because of the smaller scale benefiting from that largely, is $9,648. But in addition, we said we automated a changeover. We save labor. We save production. And actually, the electric deployment in this case produces almost a $7,000 cost reduction. So it more than pays for itself. Now, what I've done on the left side, again, I need to call your attention to the scales because the, the vertical scale on the left of the chart says uh, under pneumatic costs, total cost per year in thousands goes from zero to 45. And you'll notice that there's actually on the electric costs, uh, the vertical scale actually is negative at a point. So it's negative 8000 to $10,000. So let me show you the effect of what these different bars lead, uh, mean under pneumatic cost. The original cost we said was $40,000. If we added more devices, the cost per device would drop. Uh, if we go to a smaller compressor, you'll notice that the smaller compressor does produce about a $10,000 savings per year. But if we are frugal and turn the compressor off when we're not using it, we notice that, that the total savings can be closer to $25,000 per year. So efficient use of the compressor is very important to minimizing costs for pneumatic actuator deployments. Uh, on the right side, you notice that the modular solution is about $9,000 per year total cost, including everything. But you also notice that the productivity gauge, if you include the productivity gauge that we talked about, uh, the net effect is actually 
about a $7,000 cost savings. So that is indeed the best use for electric. Now what we have is a pneumatic versus electric actuator cost evaluation spreadsheet. We, we also have a white paper on our website available for download. Uh, but the idea was I approached this from the I from the idea that maybe I'm evaluating my uh, my facility financially and I want to see in general terms what would be best for my facility so I created a spreadsheet that allows you to input various values and do a comparison based on some generalizations that you make. Um, this first tab here is the pneumatic actuator solution cost. And uh, if I wanted to go here, for instance, and change this to 15 cents per kilowatt hour, I could do that and you could see how the numbers are affected. Everything in the red or pink boxes is something that you would have to input. Everything that's in a blue colored box or blue shaded area is something that is calculated and you cannot enter information into the wrong cell. But just for simplicity, I went ahead and I entered these numbers beforehand and it helps us get through it a little bit faster. In this particular scenario, if you take a close look, again, I'm using my, my generalized 10 cents per kilowatt hour electrical cost. And I'm saying that where would you get that? You'd get it from the electrical bill. Uh, hours per week at full load, hours per week idling, weeks per year at operation. What this allows you to do is to actually identify the number of hours per year that it's off. So if you have a situation where it's on all the time, then of course these numbers would be a lot higher. But what I'm assuming is you have a plant that's open maybe 12 hours a day. And in that 12 hours, uh, eight of those hours it's near full capacity, four of those hours it's sitting idle. So that, that's the, uh, the assumption here, and that it, the plant's in operation 50 weeks a year. So that is something that, that, that you would have to provide. The next set of information, which is down here where the, where the, the cursor is, uh, is compressor specifications. You might be, get, be able to get it off the compressor nameplate. More likely it would be the specifications of the compressor from the manufacturer. Horsepower ratings, efficiency at full load, and efficiency at idle. I think in a way 90 and 85 percent are kind of typical, uh, fairly accurate for, uh, as far as a generalization is concerned. So you could see that the number of hours, full load hours, is 800. Now, we're assuming that uh, 40 actuators are used, pneumatic actuators, at $30 per actuator on average, and the average life is three years. So based on that, that assumption, uh, our kilowatt hour cost is $16,688. The replacement cost for the actuators, and this would include the initial installation, and then it's factored into uh, we factor in uh, life expectancy to it. It is four hundred dollars per unit, and the uh, well four hundred dollars total, and the uh, total annual pneumatic system cost is seventeen thousand eighty-eight dollars. So then I'm going to go down here, and as you can see, we've used many of the same numbers: ten cents per kilowatt hour. And we're saying that with the electric actuator, we're operating 60 hours to, per week. That's 40 
plus 20, same as the last example. And total weeks per year, 50, same as the last example. We're saying we have about a 50% duty cycle, just to see the difference between full load and idle. Uh, so the number of electric actuators is 40. And again, uh, the top half of it is, is information you get off the electric bill, information you, you have to input based on the general, generalizations you make about your own facility. Uh, and then uh, the average unit cost for an all-in-one actuator would represent uh, an average for a particular application. In this case, we're saying this all-in-one electric actuator costs $1,400. Uh, then we also are evaluating a modular solution which translates to about the same price, but we've broken it into pieces. Uh, the actuator, which is the wear item, the motor, which will last a little longer, the electronics, that will have a longer life. And then the life expectancy for these is also placed in the boxes below. And then, in general, this is an estimate. Um, what we need to know is the electric power consumption of the AC all-in-one actuator and the AC modular actuator. So this information would be taken from the specification sheet. Uh, one of the things that, that would be provided there is uh, current draw uh, and current output. And th that should be readily available and enable these calculations. So basically, what you see if you look real closely here, is that the cost of the AC all-in-one actuator comes out to about $21,186 a year. The cost for the modular may be $15,583 a year. Now let's take a look at another scenario. Let's say we've got a DC all-in-one actuator. With the, the idea w was that the AC all-in-one actuator has a power cord that plugs into the wall. Or the AC modular actuator has a power cord that plugs into the wall. In this case, we have an actuator that runs off DC, and we need a separate power supply for it. Uh, generally, the DC-powered actuator is a little less expensive than the, than the, uh, than the AC-powered actuators. This bar on the left is very, very similar except we have one area here where the cursor is at now where we're, we're talking about the average unit cost of the DC power supply. So we have a similar duty cycle. We have a similar number of hours per week, weeks per year, um, same quantity of actuators, so we're not confusing things. And uh, the cost of the modular DC actuator is approximately equal to the cost of the all-in-one when you add all the components up together. And then similarly, we have to know the power supply characteristics. What is its output voltage? What is its, what is its output current? What is the maximum power uh, current draw uh, under full load? And then for the actuator, we want to know what its current consumption is at full load and at idle. And again, this would be taken from the, very often you can set this stuff up in the software for the actuator. Uh, similarly, the DC modular actuator, we need to know the power supply characteristics, the controller characteristics, and the motor characteristics. So uh, that is the current draw, current maximum current output, maximum voltage output. And you'll notice that these numbers are slightly lower, though not significantly so, compared to the AC electric actuator. I believe we're at one or two thousand dollars below them. Nineteen thousand dollars for the DC all-in-one actuator and fourteen thousand for the DC modular actuator. But there's another tab. And that other tab says uh, deals with savings as a result of automation using a, an electric actuator. Uh, first of all, we're, say, we're saying that we 
save one person's labor at $50 an hour, two hours per week, 25 weeks per year. And we're saying that during that period, we're saving 100 units of production at $1 per unit. So when you total it up for the year, the total cost savings comes out to be $7,000. And if you look at the cursor, I've included one extra box for some extra savings, whatever that may be. So when you go to look at the summary, you'll notice that in this particular example, the cost for pneumatic and cost for electric are generally in the same ballpark. If you look at the savings based on productivity improvements, you'll find that the electric actuator is actually a lot less costly. But again, the, the savings due to productivity improvements don't just happen. They have to be planned for, and it has to make sense. It could be that, that you have the large bottling conveyor that can benefit from it, or you may have the small pill conveyor that will not. Uh, that is your evaluation and uh, that is particular to your application. Well, that is about it. Is there, are there any questions? All right, Bob, can you hear me? Yes, I can. OK, uh, we have a question from Ben. I know my compressor is probably costing me a lot to run. How do I figure out whether downsizing to a smaller, more efficient model makes sense in both dollars and capacity? There is a there is a way uh, there is a way that you can you can evaluate that. Uh, what one of the, one of the things to check for is is leaks. So there's a procedure for for determining or estimating how much your system is leaking. Uh, there is also a procedure for estimating what your CFM requirement is and what, what CFM your compressor is producing. Uh, if you would care to leave your, your question offline, I could try to get good answers for you. OK, yes, we'll, we'll get that email to you, Bob. And, and for everyone else, there is a on the right side, the GoToWebinar control panel, there's a little area there for questions. You can, if you have a question for Bob, type it in there, and we'll, we'll get it answered. Uh, Toshio writes, um, why did today's discussion not mention the magnetic latch actuator? It takes only one pull to flip the state, and no power would be required until uh, reversing the state. The power consumption will be minimized or virtually none. Any thoughts on that, Bob? Uh, never heard of it. Never heard of it? All right, oh. <laughs> we'll hook you up with Toshio afterwards, and the two of you can, can chat about it. Uh, one more here, and like I say, please, uh, please send yours in. Uh, Chris says, what about leaks? How do I evaluate losses from leaks in my system? Uh, well, it, it, it involves a process of, of uh, leaving the compressor on when it's at idle and timing the cycling of the compressor. Uh, again, I, I, can, I can provide that information to you in more detail after the, after the presentation. I'd be happy to get back to you. All right. I don't see anything else coming up. So, Bob, I think you I think you covered everything and answered everyone's question. Okay. Thank well, you, everyone. The, for the, the two questions that are outstanding, sure. like I say, I'll get back to you and write more complete answers. Sure. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar from Design World. Uh, the presentation, as well as the spreadsheet that we talked about, I know several of you asked about how you get a copy of that. The presentation and the spreadsheet will be emailed out to everyone who attended either later today or tomorrow. 
and it will also be available at www.designworldonline.com. Uh, be sure to connect with Design World via Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. And you can also discuss this topic on the popular social media site for engineers, the Engineering Exchange, which is located at engineeringexchange.com. So thank you again, Bob, for a great presentation, and thank you again to Bimba. And we look forward to seeing you all uh, very soon in another Design World webinar. You're welcome.